The Bookshelf with Ryan Tuberty is brought to you by Eason, Ireland's favourite bookseller. Eason have a rich heritage of bookselling since 1886. In fact, it's probably where you got your first ever book or maybe your last one and hopefully your next one after you listen to this episode of our podcast. And stay listening for our Ryan Recommend slot, my weekly recommendation, where I'll discuss a book I've read recently that I think you'll really enjoy too. All the books we discuss on this episode of our podcast are available now in your local Eason store or indeed order online from Eason's.com before 6pm for same day dispatch with free delivery when you spend over a tenner. Eason, be inspired. Well, welcome once again to The Bookshelf with me, uh, Ryan Tuberty. Today we have a wonderful guest whose groundbreaking work has left an indelible mark on contemporary literature and film, uh, known for his iconic novel Train Spotting, along with influential works like Filth and Glue. He, he captivates audiences with his bold, uncompromising style and no shortage of humour, which I'm looking forward to getting into in the next little while. We're going to delve into this man's life through three meaningful books, a cherished childhood book, a book that made him cry, if he indeed is a crier, and the book that changed his life. Welcome to you, Irvin Welsh, to the bookshelf. Lovely to see you again. Great to see you, Ryan. I, I, I'm i going to be very honest with you and say, until I met you, I had an absolute preconceived notion of what a type of person you might be. Isn't that for you? Right. Ar- yeah, I mean... Most people think I'm going to be, um, you know, it's actually good to, to um, people get a surprise. First, they think I'm going to be a lot smaller than I am. Okay. You know, <laughs> they, they think I'm going to be some kind of short arse. And uh, they, 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 they kind of think I'm going to be like one of the worst characters in the book. You know, I'm going to, uh, in, you know, in all the, in the fiction. And, um, you know, I'm pretty easy going. I'm pretty kind of uh, sociable. Uh, so... It's always a bit of a disappointment, really, you know, for people. <laughs> or a pleasant surprise. <laughs> a pleasant surprise. Yeah, let, I, let, let's keep the glass half full and <laughs> half empty. Yeah. But I, because I thought, I didn't think I, I, we, I didn't think we'd be able to connect. I thought you'd look at me and go, oh, this guy's a pain in the hoop. And I thought, this, you'd, I'd be looking at you going, this guy's a, like, he's a tough nut. He, he's just going to be an introvert or he's going to be too cool for school. And God, I was wrong. I'm glad I was wrong. Well, I'm glad you were wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> but you do. You're, you're very. I think you're like you're. You're a bit of a softy, if that's not too strong a word to use, or softer word. But yeah, I, think, I, I mean, I'm not a tough guy. I don't no. throw my weight around. I'm not sort of uh, abrasive in in company. I mean, maybe um, in terms of sort of you know writing and sort of you know I, I can be a little bit, but um, generally I'm I'm pretty sort of um, sociable and relaxed and easygoing with people. Yeah. So do you leave a lot of the darkness for the books then, for the writing? You do put it all in there. Is that, is that the outlet? Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, you, you that you you find different aspects of yourself that you don't really bring into to to, ho- or hopefully you don't bring into life, or hopefully you've you've edited out, if, uh, you know, as, as you've got older. But they're always, yeah, we're we're all we're all kind of houses in many rooms, basically, yeah. you know, and we can all find uh, sort of different aspects of ourselves and you know you can take something that's you know a behavior that's underused or, or seldom used and you can amplify that and you can create a character out of that i'd love to get a sense of you as a kid did you were you a happy child were you a happy young lad um yeah i was i mean it's like uh i grew up in a i kind of grew up in a, a housing scheme a big housing scheme called muir house um and um but uh, I was, you know, I was basically an only child. Was, so um, I kind of grew up this kind of little Lord Fauntleroy character who had his own room and all that. Oh, my, remember, my, my, I was they were shooting this documentary on me, and I had two of my my best pals from way back. That I'm, you know, since I was six years old, like um, Colin Campbell and Dougie Webster, and they were taking part in the documentary. And they were still aggrieved that I had more room after all these years. I go, I, but you had your own room. I go, wow, well, yeah. Which was great. I didn't realise it at the time, but it was such a great place. Yeah. To, uh, such a, a very privileged kind of thing, particularly growing up in a scheme with all these bigger families. Yeah. And growing up in a scheme with all the families, was it, was it, was it communal, was it collegiate, or was it difficult, was it rough? Was it... 
It was very communal and uh, a lot of, um, we all came from Leith and we all moved down to the prefabs in Pilton first, then to the Masonettes in Muir House. It was all down the estuary with what they called the slum clearances and they kind of uh, ripped down a lot of Leith tenements and just moved people further down the fourth, basically. You know, the prefabs were up for, they were supposed to be up for five years, but they were up for 10 and then they built the Masonettes for the people who lived in the prefab. So basically we had people... Um, kind of living in the, the two blocks of flats. Uh, they were all from, um, they're all from P the Pilton prefabs and prior to that, they were all from the, uh, the Leith tenements. So everybody was kind of zoned, everybody knew each other and uh, a lot of relatives and a lot of friends and all that. So you kind of grew up in um, a kind of multiple households really. Mm. Mm, okay. Um, and where did books feature in, in all of this? Because we're getting towards your childhood book. I'm not going to go there just yet, but who was reading? What was re what was happening in that respect? Well, because there were, you know, there were, there were systems built flats and there's no, there's no room for a grand library <laughs> in there. So, so books never tended to stick around. They were always passed about. Uh, they were, you know, they, they were around, but they were always passed about. There was always some book that captured the imagination and... Uh, People would pass it around, and there were some terrible books as well. I mean, I remember my mother was really into Catherine Cookson, like yeah. all the women at that time. And Catherine Cookson, I remember reading one of these books, and even then, about ten years old, I thought, "This is horrendous. This is like uh, it was like the it was all these kind of weird, and it was t they were televised as well. I remember, you know, yeah. and uh, it was like the um, the 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 um the rape victim would always marry the rapist and it was seen as a romantic kind of, you know yeah. sort of uh, thing you know and uh, even as a ten year old boy I was thinking this is absolutely nonsense this yeah. is just weird and not right you know uh, and I would tell that to my mum and all her pals I bet but they get together in the end you know so <laughs> What? <laughs> that's not. The, this is that's not, not where we're coming yeah, from. Yeah, this is this is not the feminist message you should be giving me, mother. Like, you know. Um, so, um, so yeah. So that was, uh, you know, but they were. There's all they. They weren't. They were passed around rather than yeah. sort of. That's uh, really interesting. I, I, so, so somebody would. Somebody would have books in your family and say okay well there's this this, this is they'll be in your your place for the next well you know a, a pivotal thing for me was um my uncle jack was a fireman and he did an open university degree mm. and you know basically he passed the books on to my dad who passed them on to me and uh it was all stuff like um it was a kind of humanities and literature type course he was doing so it was stuff like uh uh, you know the 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 Brontes and Jane Austen and uh, George Eliot and but also the ones that really struck with you know kind of struck with me were uh, the Evelyn Waugh books mm -hmm. which were kind of which was such a different um, social milieu to where I came You're from. You're talking about Brideshead Revisited or something. Yeah, I was know. talking about specifically it was the, the Guy Crouchback trilogy, which are the Men at Arms. These kind of three these three sort of. Um, Books about the the kind of disillusionment of the kind of Tory patriot talk about war, right. um, and uh, I kind of I remember I was, I was doing a festival in Australia, and I was with Oberon Waugh, who was Evelyn Waugh's son, mm. and I was telling him how much Evelyn Waugh, his dad, influenced my writing, which was um, he died shortly after <laughs> Oberon Waugh, so I don't think I think the shock of it didn't do him much good. Like uh, <laughs> you contributed uh, to, yeah, so events. I probably contributed to his, his passing. But um, what I liked about it was the the male Schadenfreude of it all, like yeah. you know that kind of way that men are kind of friends and rivals at the same time, and you really caught that uh, that thing, which I think I've kind of brought into my own fiction. Yeah. So that was the the sort of take home. You know, getting my Uncle Jack's books, that kind of circuit yeah. route was a, was a big thing for me. Great. I, and were you encouraged to read them? It's kind of very grown up sort of books to be reading. I mean, who, who, where was the, the drive, the passion to pick them up? Because another kid might have said, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to read Bronte or Austin. Well, I mean, going back to the, you know, the childhood book, there was, um, what had happened, uh, you know, you start off as kind of you read comics and then you or your or your your mum and dad read to you and there's little kind of illustrations and pictures in the book. And the first ever book that I read that didn't have any illustrations in it at all, because you know you always remember the first book without pictures, basically. Mm. 
And it was a book called Lion Adventure by a guy called Willard Price. And this is going to be your choice of the book from your childhood, is it? That would be the childhood okay. book. Now, like, where, uh, how did this end up in your hands? And do you remember? Or? Uh, it was, um, it was like, uh, it was just that time that um, I think um, there was something called the Book Club Associates. You joined this book club and you got you got a book sent to you all yeah. the time. And it was just, I got, I think I got to about six or something like that. And I was reading, I was still reading kind of or six or seven. And I was reading my, my Marvel kind of DC comics and all this sort of stuff. And all my pictures got, you know. And I think my dad just said, right, enough of that now. <laughs> it's time you're reading proper books. And um, they enrolled me. My mum and dad enrolled me for this book club thing. So I got mm. a book every month, um, a hardback God, sent a to me. And it was, you know, it was great. And this, um. Bullard Price, Lion Adventure. It was just about these two sort of, um, these two posh kids, basically. Kind of, it was very like the Famous Five type yeah. of thing. You know, they were very, these, these pristine kind of uh, posh, white, upper-class English kids who would go on safari and uh, they would see the lions and, they would, you know, there was all this, there was always a mystery in it, a lion would maul someday or whatever, you know, and it was like, um, <laughs> it was, but it was, they were great books and they were very, um, to me, they were very vivid. They took you, you know, like a great book should take you away from where you are and put you somewhere else. Yes. And uh, I was in the, uh, you know, the, the 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 African savanna, and uh, you know, they, they 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 continued the franchise. It was like tiger adventure, crocodile adventure. You know, when it got to centipede adventure, I tapped <laughs> out by that time. Like you know, they were they were scraping the bottom of the barrel a bit, but they were very informative about. Yeah. Um, about animals and every kid kind of likes animals basically but uh, also about the the the, the environments that uh, the different animals lived in yeah. basically so so yeah so it was a, it was a it got me very hungry for reading that book it's not brilliant so it was like a gateway drug for definitely, your excuse there. definitely uh, you you were <laughs> here we go which brings us neatly to the rest of your career no <laughs> So silly, but here we are <laughs> from centipedes to anyway. Let, let me ask you. Centipedes were a nice segue as well. Like. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> Crawling the walls. Um, let me ask you about. Uh, I've lost the plot now. I'll be honest with you because I'm still laughing at that. But when you were reading those books, were you reading them? Uh, do you remember when you where, when and where you read? Was it? In, did you have a seat or was it in bed or was it? Yeah, I'd, um, basically I would just kind of, you know, I would sit in my bedroom and um, I would be, I was quite a, as I was quite a kind of strange kid in a way because I was both artsy and sporty. Yeah, and you're not, you're not really allowed to be artsy and sporty. <laughs> you know, you're kind of, um, and uh, it was that thing that you know, it's like oh, he's spending too much time in his in his room, get out and play, kind of sign up for the football club. And my uncle ran the local football team, and I was terrible at football, but it was always played at centre forward because yeah. because of, of my uncle. And all my mates hated me because <laughs> it was like, oh, okay. and um, and it, again, it was the uh, the boxing club as well. I was I was sent to the boxing club because all the 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 men in my dad's side of the family would go. You know that was a tradition, yeah. basically. And I was. Um, I was like this kind of poncy wee kid in the playground who wanted to write poems to girls and all this kind of stuff. I didn't want to, you know, and it was it was a great thing for me. So I actually got right into it, and I, you know, I love boxing to this day, and I yeah. do it to this day. I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, but it was great to uh, to do that. But the thing is, it's like um, you were constantly in this sort of thing that. Uh, you do the you, you do the football training on Tuesday night. You go to the boxing club on Wednesday and, and Thursday, and um, you know you you get into a kind of organised rolling program. And then you think, now nah, I'm getting fed up with this. I want to sit in my bedroom and read and write poems for a bit. Then you do that, and you come back thinking you're going to get picked for the team and yeah, all that. They say, yeah. no, where have you been? You're off the. You know, it's like I could never understand the um, that you had to go somewhere all the time yes. to do that. And I thought. What about my whims? You know what I mean. So I, w I wasn't very much a team player. It was like kind of maybe that kind of spoiled, entitled only child that the world's yeah. got to revolve around you, kind of thing. It's funny. I'm surprised you had any friends because uh, I'm you're, surprised. I'm still surprised. I'm like. still surprised <laughs> because you, you had the biggest room. You got the best position on the team. I mean, you've just lived a life of privilege, really. Massive privilege, like yeah. It's kind <laughs> of um, 
And, uh, you know, I keep, you know, I say this to Emma because she, she's kind of very posh Your wife, compared Emma, yeah. to me. Yeah. And she's, and, uh, she goes, no, 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 you have much more privilege than I am. You, you know, so yeah, and I've gone, this <laughs> 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 call it Muirhouse privilege. Like, you know. I love that. I love that. Muirhouse privilege. Yeah. It's, everything's relative, right? Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, what was your dad like? Uh, my dad was a really good guy. He was like one of his, my best mate, basically. He was, um, uh, he was kind of a trade union guy, sort of, um, very, um, very kind of political, but very moderate socialist in his politics. Mm. Like, whereas my mum was a kind of total communist kind of, mm. um, so, you know, so the pair of them would have these mad arguments right up until, you know, my mum would be a mad Stalinist. She'd say, oh, it's like, Russia can't kind of help it. It's, um, it's America that forced Russia to be like this and all this. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it was very, um, they were very kind of romantic couple, though. And it was like, you know, you grew up in this very sort of, um, my mum used to say to me, son, you were an accident. I never wanted kids. A beautiful accident, but an accident nonetheless. So I kind of felt almost, you almost felt that you were sort of, you know, you were playing Gooseberry in somebody else's romance. Like they had a very kind of um, intensely romantic relationship, you know. So uh, I think it's set, um, growing up into that kind of thing, it always set a sort of template to me that like romance was a very important thing. Basically. Did you feel in the way? Uh, sometimes, yes. Yeah, sometimes you kind of, <laughs> you, sort of <laughs> you hear the noises coming through the thin walls and you think to yourself, Man, maybe uh, I should go out and play some football instead of, <laughs> instead of sitting in here writing my poems. <laughs> uh, they say never talk about sex and politics, but unfortunately in your house, um, there's no avoiding either by the yeah, sense of Yeah, definitely not, no. No. Um, um, how old was your dad when he passed away? Uh, my dad was, he, he wasn't even 50, he was in his late 40s and I was um, kind of early 20s. It was such a, such a devastating blow because he was, you know, he was my hero basically. How did he die? Uh, he had a, he had kind of, he had, um, it had this like kind of, you know that um, sort of, uh, he had this lung kind of thing okay. that he got, he had picked up and uh, when he was in doing his national service and uh and what had happened was that it was that kind of thing that um, they used to just take your lung out if it was infected, but you don't do anymore. And it was funny because um, years later, I remember having this uh, long conversation with Hubert Selby from the, the, you know, the, the guy who wrote The Last Exit to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he had this thing as well. They had ripped really? his lung out and he was saying that he'd had all this terrible health as a result of that. It was a, kind of, a knock-on effect. They wouldn't do it now. They would kind of find a way to treat the lung, mm. basically. But, um, yeah, but the knock-on effects of it kind of um, eventually led to all these complications that, uh, you know, and, and he kept coming back from the dead like Lazarus, basically, but eventually it caught up with him. And uh, we lost him when I was in my early 20s. What, what, what effect do you think that had on you? Well, I think it had a, quite a, an effect in terms of um, sort of kind of um, me going right off the rails because up until I was, a, I, I was quite, um, I was quite sort of conformist in my teens. I was sort of, uh, you know, I, I loved sport. I loved kind of football and boxing and I loved mm. um, sort of kind of, you know, hanging out with my mates. I wasn't a sort of big kind of drinker or, or drug taker. And when I got to, when I, you know, in the, the, when he started to get really sick and um, I, I just went off the rails, kind of almost like sort of later on, I got involved, immersed in the punk scene. I got into every kind of drug that you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And I think it did have, um, because I think I didn't have the emotional vocabulary to deal with what yeah. was happening to me. I was also at the same time, I was chucked by this girlfriend that I was mad about that I was going out with. So... All these things had coalesced and really I, I couldn't handle them at the time. And uh, it just seemed like fun to just smash your way right through them, yeah. basically, rather than kind of, you know, um, it was rather escape. than deal with them. It yeah, was it was a lot of escape. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Escape from the, yeah. the grief of losing your father, the escape of, a, of a, a, a dead relationship, despite your best. Yeah, and I think a, a kind of escape from the sort of... Um, 
I mean, I, I'd left school without any qualifications. I became an apprentice TV mechanic, and I'd sort of uh, I'd packed in that job, and I'd I'd gone down to London to um, I was working in kind of hotels and sort of kitchen portering and all that. And I think it was working on building sites, and I think it was like um, an escape, not just from the the, the these kind of the, you know bereavement and relationship breakdown, but also from the the kind the sort of m the mundane life that I saw lying ahead for me, basically. Really? Uh, yeah, and also that um, that kind of trash, kind of facetic that you have when you aspire towards a certain kind of dark art, mm. basically. You know that you know. I was listening to a lot of Velvet Underground and mm. all that kind mm, of stuff. Mm. You know, and you 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 think this is what I want to be. I want to. I want to be an artist of some kind, yeah. basically. You, 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 when you described the, your childhood book a little while ago and the posh boys and their tigers and ultimately the centipedes, you got your escape through that portal, as we call the books in some ways, and they, they, they took you away from the, from the house and the housing estate maybe and, and whatever it might have been. Where did the drugs take you? Um, I think that, I think that to, to me it was like... Uh, it was a, a sort of adventure. It was a, like a, a, a kind of punk thing. You've you found your tribe. You know, you've got this bunch of people around. Um, and London was great for that because you had um, you had misfits from all over, mm. basically. You know, and they had found each other. You know, sort of like uh, not just misfits from London or from Edinburgh or Glasgow or Liverpool or Manchester, but from little kind of um, from places on the continent, from little kind of towns and villages and sort of all that. So. You, you all came together and you all had this like-minded thing and uh, hedonism and drugs were very much a part of that, you mm. know, and uh, and a lot of people got lost in that kind of thing, you know, as you do, you know. Um, and, you know, the idea that um, I think that you're, you're not just taking drugs as an escape from life, you're also taking drugs as a validation and a sort of for, for the joy of life and... Uh, you know, one can become the other very quickly. So you have to you have to keep an eye on yourself. And you're mm. not really good at doing that when you're younger. Um, what I did see is that uh, when I was in rehab, I saw a lot of people there that were were using heroin, particularly as a as as a way of kind of managing the pain that they've had of some kind of yeah. post traumatic stress. Mm. Um, from abuse or from some kind of anxiety or some kind of physical pain even, yeah, that uh, that things couldn't quite get to. Um, for me, there was none of that, you know. There was, um, it was, it was basically sort of um, having that kind of hedonistic urge for adventure and just getting in too deep. Let me talk about your next book. It's the book that made you cry. Um, and it's one that stumps a lot of our guests on this podcast because they say, oh, I'll cry at a film and I'll cry if I hear bad news. But for some reason, books don't make me cry. Do, do, do you fall into that category or where are you? I them? think so. Yeah, I think it's it's difficult for... Um, see, I always find the great thing about a book is that you can put it down. You know, and when, it, when anything gets too emotionally intense, yeah. you can stick it down. I mean, I wouldn't... Um, this thing, I mean, I write for film and TV now. I wouldn't put things on screen that I can put in a book because the reader's sovereign in the book. The reader's making their own film, basically, in sure. their mind. So they can put it down anytime they like. They can, they, can, they can halt it. They can kind of take a little bit of time out to think about it and reconfigure it in their, their, their consciousness. Um, whereas film and TV, you're subject to other people's images. You're just bombarded with this and you have to go with it. Um so yeah, I mean, I kind of feel that um, that uh, it's difficult to cry uh, at a book. I think the um, the closest I've come to crying at a book. I mean, I, I cry at uh, any r romantic comedy. I'll cry. You know, I'll be sitting there, sort of, um, so sort of trying to try not to to look at Emma. I'll be looking away, and she'll just. It's be a like, rom com. Yeah, anything. The cheesiest, cheesier. You know, I can't. I've, I find it. If I go to watch a, a horror film and people's arms are getting pulled off and all that, I'll just <laughs> laugh because I think it's just actors that are uh, messing around with prosthetics and stuff like that and uh, CGI. But if I see somebody that's um, kind of being emotional and, you know, they're upset or sad or they're sort of, um, or they're kind of expressing tenderness for each other on the screen, um, 
because these are, these are such big human emotions, I can't separate. To, I can't say this is just actors faking it on the screen. Wow. I get really immersed in it. And I get really God. I can't watch this. I'm kind of uh, turn away. My eyes are sort of welling up and sort of you know. You, you wrote train cheap, spotting. Yes. What, what, yeah, yeah, how, yeah, how is yeah, this? Yeah. How is this? Am I like what? Yeah. No. The chasing you, that really makes me. It, kind of, it really kind of gets to me. <laughs> Um, what the hell? But um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think a book to the only book that, you know, the last book I can think about that made me feel that I was just like, I think it was the very end of Ian Banks's The Bridge. You're going to go for Ian Banks' The Bridge, okay? Yeah, because tell us a um, bit about that book. Well, you know, the the bit that got me, you know, the 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 end of it is this guy's in a coma and um, he's. Uh, He's trying to, you know, like he's, you know, it's, it's a device I use myself in Marabu Stortnimers. Mm. It's like a guy who doesn't want to confront what's going on in his life and he's working through things. And he's basically, the bit that made me kind of almost cry was that um, the end where his girlfriend w was making a sort of, you know, was trying to get him to come out of the coma and he just opened his eyes and um, he made a quite a kind of flippant but happy remark. You know, he was happy to be back there and to be with her. And it was such a beautiful end to this book, to this very intense book. Um, and I was almost like kind of, you know, but I do have that degree of distance normally from a book. You know, yes. But you know, I couldn't actually put it down because you know, there was only about that much left yeah, when yeah, he, yeah. he hit you with the uppercut, basically. Wow. Wow, that's power. This is what I love about your, the way you've described that. It's the power of writing. I mean, there are times that I can read a book and I nearly have to drop it. It's going, wow, how do they do that? You know, how do you do that? I mean, that is amazing. But I think what I'm taking from this is that you get, is you're just, you're probably the biggest romantic I've met in this series. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and they've come from all walks of life. But this I was not expecting because you've described... And actually, if we go back to our, earlier in the conversation, you know, the, even the two boys with their chasing the tiger and, and, and the boxers and your pals on the estate slagging you for being Lord Vaughan, you love relationships or the dynamic of relationships, the friendships. I mean, this, this keeps coming up here. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, these are the things. These are the things that galvanize your 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 writing. These are the things that inform your writing. You kind of, um, you know, it's like. Uh, I'm sort of um, one of the things that's always interested me is that how we, uh, when things are going bad for us, we we compound that by making further bad decisions. You know, uh, you know, if you kind of um, you're not thinking straight, are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if, if you go home and you kind of you you sort of um, you you burst in on your girlfriend and your best mate having sex on the couch or something like that, you know. Your first instinct is like you know, not again. Pick up the bread, <laughs> pick up the bread knife, or, or or run down to the um, to the pub and just do loads of alcohol and loads of drugs and <laughs> yes. all that. None of these things are going to do you any good. You're going to make the situation worse. You know, <laughs> the best thing you can do is just say, "Oh well, get on with it," and then just leave. You know, <laughs> pack your stuff and, leave, and move on to the next person. But you don't actually see that at the time. Yes. You have to go through this whole process of hurt and acting mm. out and. Um, I mean, lawyers make a fortune on that for divorce, like, you know, because they think, God, they are, they're, luckily these people are going to hate each other for a while until they yeah. work all this out and this is where we make money. Yeah, well, it. hate is lucrative, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but, uh, yeah, so, but that that's what fascinates me. I mean, I like the, you know, so I like the idea of this guy who's just seen his, um, he's just come in and seen his, his girlfriend and his best friend shagging on the couch then he goes to the pub and he bumps into this other guy who's just been down his knee and proposed to his girlfriend in our in our in our sort of uh you know in our lunch break you know and they're sitting at the bar and you know one of them says the world is like this and one says no no the world is like this yeah, you know yeah. so these, these are the things that um these are the things that the stuff of drama and the, you know the stuff of the construction of drama. Yeah. It's all about people and about relationships and about the psychology between them and how they um, how they make all that happen and how all that comes together. Your your observation on class is always fascinating because I love how your books have one take on it. Um, you've described yourself already as Little Lord Fauntleroy because you had the big room in the house. You read Evelyn Waugh. Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, 
uh, in a working class estate in in Scotland. You married, uh, to use your own expression, uh, a posh woman in Emma. I, you are a very confusing man, and I'd love you to try and explain yourself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't. I mean, I, it's um, you know, I've, I've um, I don't, you know, I'm not sort of. Uh, I don't like target posh birds or anything like that. You know, it's like I, I sort of, <laughs> I like to mix it up a bit across all social. You're classes, very generous. Like, yeah, 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 generous equal, equal opportunities guy. Yeah. I'm definitely an equal opportunities employer in terms of romance. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I just, you know, I, I like to experience different things. I like to sort of, I like to travel. To, you know, all I've ever wanted to do was to, was to travel and to, um, you know, and to sort of, uh, and to enjoy kind of, you know, enjoy meeting new people and enjoy sort of having um, new experiences. Uh, and I think yeah, ultimately that seems to to me to be why I'm here, basically, is to sort of, uh, is to jump around and to, uh, and, to get in, <clears throat> and to get involved in things and to take an interest mm. in things and to satisfy my curiosity about things, about people and places. Do you think you have a responsibility to keep the link from your working class roots to your present circumstances, which are very far removed in terms of your ability to, in terms of your wealth, let's call it what it is, uh, relative, whatever that might be. Um, or do you think it's one should park that and say, well, I, I, I started life there and I'm here now, so leave me alone. Do you know, how does that work? Um, no, I think you, I think um, for me, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I love where I came from. I'm proud of where I came from. I, mm. I, I never, it, it was never about letting go of that. I always wanted to travel, but not in a sense of running away from anywhere. Uh, there was, you know, I've, I've, um, I'm back down in Leith all the time. I'm kind of, I still hang out with the same people. My, you know, my two, my, a couple of my best pals, most of my best pals I've known since my teens through the, you know, yeah. uh, through the football and through, um, and th you know, through the scheme and through Leith. And, you know, so that's very much, it's not, you know, I don't, I don't hold on to that for some sort of, but I don't hold on to, you know, for some sense of, um, I want to, kind of stay working class or see myself as this man and the people. I hold on to because I like it, basically, because yeah. I enjoy kind of, I enjoy my friendships and I enjoy sort of yeah. the place that I come from. Um, Leith Walk's still the coolest street in the world, basically, you know, so you kind of, uh, you're, 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 I'm very lucky. I feel very fortunate to have come from such a place, basically, and I don't want you know, and it's like, if you, feel, if you come from one of the best places uh, that you can possibly come from, you don't really, you know, particularly sort of want to be anywhere else so you don't feel that um that uh you know you're you're running away from that it's always going to be part of you basically and you always want it to be part of you your life changed with a certain book and it's our third book that we go to today uh, the book that changed your life um um i could hazard a guess but i don't know where you're going to come from on this one but uh, spill the beans Irvin welsh where are we going uh i think i'm gonna to have to go for train spotting because it literally you know i mean it literally did so it's more, you know, it's my own book, but it did, you know, if, if you're being honest about a book changing your life, I mean, it was, um, I was a, a kind of, I wanted to do something creative. I was a failed musician. I was kind of pushing 30 and um, I think, you know, you know, I've never felt as old as when I was pushing 30 because, mm -hmm. you, because yeah, it's, all, it's like, I think you always feel that if you want to do something creative, it always feels like you're approaching the last chance saloon because mm -hmm. You orientate yourself more around musicians, and you think you know they're all you know they all kind of hit big when they're quite young. You know, you think well, late twenties now it's not going to happen. Have a go at writing this book. So, um, I finished it when I was about thirty-one. I think it was published when I was thirty-two. I finished it when I was thirty, and it was published at thirty-two, and um, it kind of uh, just went a bit crazy really you know it yeah. was like the, the first publisher i sent it to was you know the biggest publisher in britain and random house and it was published straight away uh it became a bestseller straight away it, it uh, became a successful play it became a successful film and all the international sales kind of grew up around that and it's so so I suddenly, within a space of a few years, I was, from having been a serial failure in uh, music, from having sent all these cassette tapes and bands 
and not even got a reply mm -hmm. from uh, record companies. They just probably just laughed and threw them in the straight in the bucket. But suddenly I was, um, I was this like international best-selling author kind of, and because of the, the, the underground youth culture mm -hmm. kind of nature of it, I was this, um, I was, I was this kind of celebrity, mm. basically, you know, this kind of Britpop kind of celebrity. Yes. Anyway. So it was all, all this was happening at the same time. So, uh, so my life did change or, you know, or I, I had to, um, it changed materially in terms of money and in terms of recognition. Um, and it, most of all, it changed in terms of time. You know, I was, I had that great gift that every writer wants, the time to write, you know, I was able to pack in the day job. At that time, I was working for the council back at Edinburgh, uh, and it was great. It was fabulous. It was like that was the the gift of it. But um, you you also there's the downside to that kind of fame and exposure is that you have to try very hard to hold on to the bits of yourself that you like, basically, and you have to stake out a claim for yourself. You know, and did you? Um, yeah, I did. I mean, I I got I kept running away from it. Um, when I moved, I moved back down to London, and the whole thing was getting a bit crazy. So um, I went to Amsterdam, basically, like, like Renton. Basically, I, yeah. I moved to Amsterdam for a couple of years, uh, and then with the film, it started kicking off there. And uh, then I, I moved over to to the States for a, a brief spell, and then to um, to Manchester briefly, and then to Dunfermline in Scotland, like oh. you know, which is kind of was a bit a strange. A strange move, and then back to Edinburgh, and then back to London. I was always, I was always on the move, yeah. basically, and then to to Ireland, and then to America. You're always on the move. I mean, even in the bit brief time that I've got to know you in the last year, it's not even a year; it's a year in November. Is uh, you're, I mean, you can, I can watch you on Instagram if nothing else. You're always on the move at book festivals, and I know that you can, you know, you've kind of, I think the anchor's gone down in London a bit more now, and but you seem to be in perpetual motion. Yeah, well, I've got the, you know, I have the the DJing, I have the the literary festivals, um, we have the the record company, and we, yeah. you know, we're always putting our stuff out. We've got some um, some fabulous releases this year. And uh, we, you know, so it keeps me busy, you know, and it yeah. keeps me occupied. Uh, and as well as books, obviously, you know, I work in TV and film as well, you know. So yeah. you're you're constantly on the move with, with you know, and I've, um, my manager is still in America, um, and I still do stuff out there. So I'm out there all the time. Right, and, it's exciting though. But it's, that's what I've always wanted. Yeah. I've always wanted to be moving. I've always wanted to be involved in different things. I've always wanted to be kind of meeting different people, mm. working with different people and having that, being able to learn from different people. And you've completed your the crime thril trilogy as well, which is exciting. We've got the crime trilogy written now, you know, I've got the resolution, which is the, the final book. Congratulations. In that, um, in that trilogy, which really only came about because of lockdown. Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, I had no ambitions to write a, a, a crime franchise. And then when it started to win the TV, uh, when ITVX and Britbox took it on, and then um, I did a second one, you know. So now I've got the third one, yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll do that as the third show of crime. They're, ter they're terrific books, and they're like no other. You know, like yourself, you are a unique, iconic writer. And when you put your attention to the crime genre, you did it with great, great. You're gonna have my, you're style. gonna have my head swelling out, right? Yeah, hope yeah. We can, hope we can. You, you've got a, a horseshoe to get me through. We, we, that we, door, we've like, we've called yeah. maintenance to Brilliant. fix to, the door on the way on the way out. Um, I asked you about your dad earlier on, um, and uh, uh, I know that she, your mum passed away not too long ago. And uh, can I ask you about her and, and her influence on you? Was, yeah, was my mum was my mum was quite. Um, she was quite a tough customer. Like, you know, yeah. what was her name, sir? Jean. Yeah, I could never kind of, um, I could never get too wide with her. Cause she wide was always, being, yeah, yeah, smart yeah, or too smart, big for your head, smart, or yeah, both. Like, you know, mm. uh, she would always cut me down to to size, but very quite ruthless. And um, I got it was quite upsetting when you saw her getting a bit older, and um, I missed the kind of I was kind of started to treat her like a, a mum in a way instead of having the cut and thrust of mm. kind of uh, with her. So I missed that. I missed that kind of sparring with her. Uh, I thought, and um, I miss kind of um, 
treating her like a wee old woman in a way, you know, like my wee old mum and like that kind of thing. Because we never had that relationship. She was always quite, quite a tough cookie, basically. But there was a time, is that what you're saying? There was a time when towards the end that she became more m maternal. Your relationship was more She was always filial. quite maternal, but she was always quite, you know, very huggy and sort of demonstrative and all that. Yeah. But she lost that bit of an edge, you know, she got a yeah. bit, more, bit, bit more whimsical and... Um, and it was kind of tough to, uh, I felt like I was bullying her if I kind of uh, ripped the piss out of her. And then, you know, so I, I had to stop doing that. Um, and I went, you know, I thought, I said, well, you know, my mom's died. She's lived till 95 and all that. She's had yeah. a good life. And um, and I thought, I'm going to I'm gonna go and travel on my own and do a bit of, uh, and get the backpack and just wander around in the desert in Australia. Soul search. Yeah, I thought, but I'd always wanted to go to Alice Springs and I, cause I had this Oxford um, atlas and I used, was fascinated by being right in the middle of Australia. So I went there and um, I wandered around and I, you know, I, I thought I was, I, I was waiting for this Jim Morrison moment out in the desert. I was wanting to, to hear the voice of my mum and my dad and all the people that have been close to that I've lost and um, I thought this would be quite a, an emotional moment, you know. Uh, and nothing at all. Although I did get lost in the desert and all, I walked the wrong way along the riverbed and had to kind of, I was massively underdressed for the... For you got all, physically you know. lost, but not Physic spiritually lost. Not, not spiritually no. lost, like, you know. And as a, uh, a few days later, I was kind of, uh, you know, no big Jim Morrison at the moment, but I was sitting watching uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 in a matinee and everything that happened to that wee raccoon guy sort of triggered me like about my mum like, oh mum i'm sorry i'm sorry i've been such a bad son i love you come back mommy come back you know uh because of this little raccoon being imprisoned in guardians of the galaxy 3 and the, you know the music from the cassette tape and all this kind of stuff um so that was uh that was a triggering break lucky there was there was only three other people in the in the the, the cinema i was quite near the front i was like <laughs> <laughs> and they were at the back, kind of hearing me making all these noises, like you know. You know, you went to like the desert, and you could have I just gone to, to the, the local desert. cinema. Yeah. Um, did it? Yeah. Did it help you to to? It sounded like it's like a modern version of keening. Like, did it help you to let it out? Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like uh, it's funny these things. Um, they come back to you. I mean, I lost a, a very dear friend last week, uh, American writer Don DeGrazia, who was kind of my, my, my best pal and kind of my best pal in Chicago Gosh, okay, uh, for years. That. And uh, it was a very sudden kind of death and it was a shock. And um, I think, you know, the last um, week or so has been this, like, it's been a deluge of all these, uh, you know, they all come back to you, all yeah. these losses, basically. Um and you know, one thing triggers another. Uh, so that's been quite a, an interesting time. I think. I think um, it sounds a bit perverse, but I think instead of catastrophizing these things as we tend to do now, I think you have to kind of lean into them and enjoy them in a way. You have to yeah. enjoy the, the the feeling of being human and the feeling of sort of um, having kind of um, experienced these loves and experienced these losses. Yeah. And put it into context for your own life to say, right, we'd better get busy living and continue. Yeah, living. get busy living, get on with yeah, it, and yeah. like you know, because that's you know, everybody would want that for you. They want you to be the you know to to live the very best life that you can live and to to get on with it, um, and to you know to enjoy it basically. Um, the the last question we ask is to tell us the name of the autobiography you haven't written yet. We're not asking you to write one because you mightn't want to write to write one. I'm sure you've been asked um, to write one, but. It's just the title we're looking for, but I will ask you why we're here. Any plans to do so? Or no, I've had a, lot, a few people have said, um, but uh, have asked me about it. But uh, it's, it's strange because there's two documentaries being done on me, and uh, I think one's out at the end of this year, and the other one's out in spring. Great. And um, one of them is funny because one of them followed me around uh, for a year, basically. And you always think you have quite a boring life because you're inside your own head and you don't really, everything that's happening in the background is just furniture. But, you know, there I was, it was kind of like, you know, in Ibiza and in Berlin and Miami and LA and, um, you know, I'm just doing my thing basically. And I think, and I'm looking at this on the screen and I'm thinking, 
God, this is quite interesting. This is quite an interesting. <laughs> Who's but that guy? Yeah, but you don't you don't really see yourself yeah. in your you don't really see yourself in your own life sometimes. No, You're never. Just going through this this uh, this kind of thing, you know. Um, but uh, the idea of, to sit down and to write something, um, I think, is a I'm all, I'd be tempted to fictionalize too much. It would just mm. be a pack of lies and it would turn into one of my books, basically. <laughs> so what are you going to call it? Um, probably a pack of lies would be the, <laughs> the, 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 the thing that, that I would call it, like if, if I ever got around to doing it, which I, I don't think I would. Okay, good title though. Uh, we really enjoyed talking about our books today, Irvin Welch. Uh, yeah, it's great to talk about books instead of um, <laughs> the other things, basically. <laughs> 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 the same old, same old, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, it's good to see you in such good form and uh, look forward to raising a glass with you somewhere soon. But in the meantime, mind yourself and thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers. So here's this week's Ryan Recommends brought to you by Eason, Ireland's favourite bookseller. I'm going with the man who brought the world. I am Pilgrim. It's Terry Hayes. The book is The Year of the Locust. This is just a classic spy adventure. This is the book that is built for June, July, August. In other words, holiday time. It's a spy rump. It'll take you to Pakistan. It'll take you to Iran. It'll take you to Afghanistan. It's infiltrating the baddies to save the West. Boom! Quite literally along the way, you're going to love this. This is a cracker. And this book and all the books we discuss on this episode of our podcast are available now in your local Eason store or order them online from Eason's.com before 6pm for same day at dispatch with free delivery when you spend over a tenner. Eason, be inspired. Mm-hmm.